you, Joe. It, it was incredibly uh, exciting to be uh, asked by uh, President Trump's uh, top advisor to uh, create the slideshow uh, you're about to uh, see, but I'm going to tell you two stories uh, first. One is uh, Joe mentioned that I wrote the plan to devolve uh, US EPA uh, actually over a five-year period uh, down to a committee of the whole, the 50 uh, state agencies who do all the work. I'll be talking about that in the last panel uh, today. Uh, but I had written this uh, plan and uh, Heartland published it into a booklet. And shortly thereafter, I was on a program here in Washington with Senator Inhofe. And uh, he preceded me uh, on the, uh, uh, the podium to give uh, a talk. And uh, I had a feeling that he was going to give his talk and leave, and he wouldn't hear me talking about uh, devolving uh, EPA uh, and eliminating it over a period of time time and turning their uh, all responsibilities to the 50 states. So uh, he had a question period and, and uh, I raised my hand and I said, Senator Inhofe, uh, are you going to be here a little while uh, from now when I speak? He said, no, I have to go to a meeting. And I said, well, I really came here primarily uh, to personally hand you uh, this plan uh, that I wrote on behalf of Heartland to uh, eliminate, phase out EPA over a period of time and turn it over to a committee of the whole of the 50 states. And uh, I said that I'm probably the only living scientist uh, in the country today who uh, has to claim responsibility that there is a U.S. EPA because between uh, 1968 and 1971 I was on a blue ribbon committee studying the idea of creating a environmental protection agency, you know, which uh, President Nixon signed in 71, and I'm kind of now uh, doing penance for that crime, and uh, so I wrote this plan uh, to get rid of it. And he paused for a second and he said, Dr. Lair, if uh, you think uh, going around uh, presenting this plan to get rid of EPA makes up for the crime you committed in creating EPA, you're, uh, you're, you're wrong. And, uh, uh, Everybody fell out of their chairs uh, laughing, and he's, uh, he's probably right. But actually, for 10 years, uh, EPA did good work. We wrote uh, seven uh, pieces of legislation that created a safety net. Uh, not a single uh, useful piece of legislation was uh, passed after uh, 1980, and uh, we're now, uh, I think, going to turn the clock back and uh, uh, take this, uh, the onerous burden off of us. Well, that's, that's one story. Uh, the second one is, if I don't really uh, understand all of the slides I'm going to show you thoroughly, it's uh, because of what happened to me on uh, the airplane coming here uh, yesterday, and uh, it's a message uh, for you uh, that, that I feel very strongly about. I was studying uh, the slides that, that Joe and Jim Lakely and I had created for President Trump, and uh, what I was going to say to you this morning and there was a woman uh, next to me that kind of looked over my shoulder and, and saw some of the uh, slides uh, about uh, global warming and, and seeing that uh, uh, we were not uh, in, in believers that uh, man caused uh, the temperature of the planet to go up, down, or sideways. And uh, she started questioning me. Well, she turned out to be a super liberal professor of social work at uh, Ohio University in Athens. And uh, she started challenging me, and she had clearly read all the alarmist stuff. She said, well, how can you say man is not causing global warming? And 97% of all the scientists believe that. And, and she said, how can you say that when clearly all the glaciers are melting? And, and wildfires, tornadoes, and hurricanes are increasing. How can you say these things? Well, I kept my cool very, very calmly. Uh, the plane was delayed for a half hour on the ground. I had an hour flight, and I just gave up uh, studying for this very presentation, and I calmly described to the, her the uh, evidence uh, in, in reverse. And then I made a really good decision. I said, tell me about your work. And it turned out that she worked uh, on drug addiction in, uh, in southern Ohio. She uh, worked on prison reforms, talked about the fact that we imprison more people percentage of our population than anybody, uh, any other country.
uh, country in the world. <clears throat> and, and so I really made friends with her in her area. And then she came back and she started uh, asking more questions. At the end of uh, the hour and a half, we arrived here. She said to me, you know, everything you've said to me is really interesting. Could I give you my husband's email and would you contact him because he believes absolutely reverse and you have now uh, convinced me that we're wrong? I mean, what a victory. I mean, I, I literally, I, I, I floated off that plane. Now, I had the good fortune of having an hour and a half to do that. But I'm going to challenge everybody in this room that in the next year, and, and what you heard Senator Inhofe say, and, and, and Joe as well, uh, the battle is not over. We have won the science clearly in any debate. Uh, an intelligent audience would recognize uh, we win, and, and I'm going to show you what we prepared uh, for President Trump in a moment. But the battle is going to go on. I, I suspect that we will not bury the global warming uh, situation uh, until the very end of President Trump's eight-year administration. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the challenge I make to you is that in the next year and every year following, uh, set a target to turn the minds of five people, five people in a year, and I say that because it's not going to be something you're going to do, you know, in two minutes at a cocktail party. Uh, it, it's going to be an opportunity of, of talking to somebody that you think you know, is reasonably intelligent and would listen to you for a period of time, maybe over a period of time. Uh, and, and there are 200 people in this room. If we all uh, set our goal as uh, changing the minds of, of five reasonably uh, neutral, sensible people, uh, that'd be a thousand people. And the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So uh, we, we, we've won scientifically, but we still have not uh, won the attitude of the whole public, and that's what we want to do. All right, let me uh, go on. What we did uh, for President Trump, and I, I think it is very exciting, is <clears throat> essentially to turn back uh, every single uh, argument that uh, the, the alarmists uh, have. And uh, these are the five or six areas that I'll go through uh, very briefly in uh, uh, talking about the, uh, the slides. The, the first slide shows that... Uh, as Joe mentioned, half the public still uh, feels that man is responsible for global warming. And I'm going to tell you my bias right now. I, I have a bias that maybe is a little different uh, than anybody in the room. And I think, uh, I, I don't know if it was Joe uh, said it or Senator Inhofe, uh, well, I think Joe quoted uh, one of our new government officials uh, saying that man is not the primary responsibility for uh, climate change. Carbon dioxide is not the primary reason for climate change. I'll go a step further. I mean, I've been involved in this since the mid-70s when every prominent news magazine, that would be Time, Newsweek, and U.S. News and World Report, had a cover story of the impending ice age uh, the, the coming glacier, I really got involved then, been following it now uh, for 40 years. And I will say carbon dioxide has no impact on, on, our, on the temperature of the planet. Most scientists will say, well, it may be a little bit. But, but you, there, I, you know, I, Warren Buffett gives away a, a, a million dollars if you get your bracket right in the NCAA tournament. Uh, I think I'd give a million dollars if I had a million dollars. That's an old Russian joke. I'd, uh, if I had two houses, I'd give you one. Somebody says, uh, would you give me your shirt? And the Russian says, no, I have two. Uh, <laughs> but nobody, nobody can nail down the role of carbon dioxide and, and say it's a 1% impact, 10%, no it's, it's none. So that's my bias that I think comes through in what we presented. But half the public still thinks it plays a, uh, a major role. As was pointed out by Senator Inhofe, it comes out last in terms of the concerns of the public. There are, are 17, I think, uh, maybe less, uh, issues the public is concerned about. Bjorn Lomborg started this. He started a consensus 
Um, every, uh, uh, every other year, economists meet in Copenhagen, and they vote on what, what matters in the world. Where would you put your money, basically? <clears throat> Global warming comes out uh, last. Of the people who voted in the last election, 14% <clears throat> of uh, people who voted for Trump thought climate change was a problem. 66% of, uh, of Clinton people. While uh, the names, uh, 66, yeah, so why the names of Trump and Clinton are up there, uh, I want to caution uh, all of you or, or really uh, give you a hint to how to feel better about life. I woke up on the morning of November 9th. Actually, I wasn't, I never went to bed. It was way too exciting. I, I woke up euphoric. And I have woken up euphoric every day since. But, but I have an edge on most of you. Most of you are happy with the election of, of President Trump, but you're measuring life against a level playing field. You say, well, Trump is better than nothing. No, Trump is better than Clinton. You've got to measure the hole we would have been in if the wicked witch had been elected. And then you measure up from the bottom of the hole to where we are now. And if you don't wake up euphoric, you, you just have a negative view of life. <clears throat> um, this is where the temperature has been the last uh, 10,000 years, where we've been on a general decline. You are aware that uh, we essentially ended a little ice age when George Washington was at Valley Forge. And you, 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 all of you that understand what Valley Forge was about, you wonder how those soldiers survived and how we were able to continue fighting the war because that was uh, a low point in temperature. Uh, I mean, it was really freezing. From, from Valley Forge on, we have you know, warmed up to a, a little bit of normalcy, but as you know, we've not warmed up in the last uh, 18 years. Uh, satellites uh, show the temperature has been relatively constant. The other line are uh, the predictions of, of, of absurd uh, models. Uh, the See, what's this? That one is, uh, OK. You can read it. I can't. <laughs> but uh, you can see stability there. <clears throat> one of the uh, most interesting things is how little carbon dioxide is in the, in the uh, atmosphere. It's uh, four, roughly four hundredths of a single percent. Common sense, and, and that's what we tried to get across to President Trump, common sense would tell you how can four hundredths of 1% of a gas in the atmosphere control climate to the point that we have been spending an average of $6 billion a year uh, fighting it for uh, over a, a decade. But this is my favorite diagram. There is a picture of the Earth, and superimposed over it are 10,000 dots. There are 10,000 dots on the, that picture. The green dots represent the primary greenhouse gas, which you all know is water vapor. The large uh, uh, black area in the bottom is uh, carbon dioxide. But the tiny little square, the tiny little uh, square in the bottom right-hand corner is man's contribution to carbon dioxide. Factories, automobiles, and power plants. I, I mean, how impossible it is to think that that little tiny bit it, it controls the temperature of the planet. It, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. Uh, here is uh, carbon dioxide measurements going back thousands of years. And that used to be much higher. We're at 400 now. We were at 1,800 when the dinosaurs worked the Earth. And I'm one of the few people that remember that uh, vividly. <laughs> this is carbon dioxide. That's temperature. Where's the link? Where is the, uh, the link between the two? There simply uh, is, is none at all. There's no relationship. And if you've read uh, Fred Singer and Dennis Avery's book, uh, Temperature Change uh, Every 1,500 uh, Years, one of the things we know for sure is that when we go back 900,000 years of ice core records, the uh, increase in temperature comes centuries before the increase in carbon dioxide. 
which you should all know if you drink any carbonated soda. You open a can of carbonated soda, you forgot about it and you left it on the counter and you come back when it's warm and it's not carbonated anymore because warm water gets rid of its carbon dioxide, cold water has, uh, has more of it. So there, there just is uh, no link. Here's another uh, picture essentially showing the uh, uh, temperature uh, versus the increase in carbon dioxide and there has been an increase. We were at 280 uh, at World War II. We're at 400 now. Somebody in the audience, uh, other than Craig Itso, yell out to me the level of carbon dioxide at which we all perish. 150. 150. We were perilously close in World War II at, two, uh, at 280. Uh, something, this, this slide's a little bit complicated, but I'll explain it very quickly. The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has already absorbed all of the, the heat it's capable of absorbing from the planet. Uh, carbon dioxide only absorbs a very narrow range, a very narrow range uh, in the, the heat spectrum. And the carbon dioxide in the air has already absorbed that. We can double carbon dioxide. It isn't, it isn't going to create any more uh, warming at all. And this kind of shows how that's, uh, we're, we're down to virtually uh, nothing. Here are the models. We finance 117 models. We should only need one model. Uh, they average them out. They average 117 mistakes. Does that make any sense? Of course not. The satellite readings, you know, it's ridiculous, and yet we have been plowing close to $6 billion a year into supporting them, and of course we know the temperature of the planet has not uh, changed. Uh, we, we, I guess we were conservative saying 15 years. We're pretty close to, uh, to 20 now. So now we go into all the areas that the nice lady sitting next to me uh, challenged me on that in fact, you're aware we went from global warming to climate change. What do we talk about now? Extreme weather. Extreme weather is now <clears throat> the password. So we created a slide for President Trump on each of these uh, extremes. These are uh, heat waves over a, a long period of time. You can see there's nothing new there. These are droughts. The bottom of the, is the, the heaviest drought up to the top to milder droughts. You can see there's no change over time uh, there. Uh, what do we have there? Tornadoes. If you live in uh, Oklahoma, as Senator Inhofe does, it's called Tornado Alley, Oklahoma, Kansas. We've not had any increase in tornadoes. Most of you are aware. We have not had a uh, hurricane uh, touch uh, land in, in uh, 10 years. Wildfires are on the way down. Uh, I was amazed how smart this woman was, at least reading the newspaper. She, she knew all the scare stories. And uh, I was able, over an hour and a half, to uh, refute them. Here's the hurricane uh, slide. They're all very simple, and uh, Joe and, and Jim Lakely are really more responsible uh, for the slides than I uh, were able to uh, show one would very quickly show President Trump. Now, what, he, what they asked us, what they asked us was, as you well know, I was told, and you know, President Trump has called global warming a hoax. What he wanted was the technical support for his position that it is a hoax. Now, I'm a little worried, I've got to admit. Uh, there are two people in his administration who are unsure of it being a hoax and may cause us uh, to still spend money. I hope not. Uh, one is his daughter who makes great dresses, <clears throat> but she's uh, a greenie and one of her closest friends is Chelsea Clinton and that should scare the hell out of you. Um, and the other, unfortunately, is Rex Tillerson who uh, wants to stay in the game. I think he's going to be a great Secretary of State, but I hope he doesn't have too much influence on uh, the president's position of climate change. Sea level hasn't changed at all. Tom Weissmuller is on the uh, program, uh, and he's, uh, that's one of his areas of expertise. Uh, worked for NASA for years, and 
we know that sea level rises, uh, I think, it's seven inches a, a century or seven centimeters, and it's been the same for 800 years. We've got terrific uh, sea level measurements. You can see high water marks all over the, the globe, and we know it's, uh, there's been no change in, uh, in sea level. Um, <clears throat> I teach economics, and uh, one of my heroes up until a week ago was Art Laffer. Art Laffer writes a lot about economics and, and really bright. And when he was challenged on uh, money spent on uh, global warming, his response was scary, I'm about to tell you. He said, I have to refer to my friend Al Gore on that. <laughs> that was the end of him being a hero of mine. Uh, one of the great things with the increase in carbon dioxide is the increase in yields in, in agriculture. As you can see here, uh, wheat production, rice production, uh, soy and corn have all increased as a result. You all know carbon dioxide is to a plant what oxygen is uh, to us. Um, in uh, the, the volumes that we've put out, Climate Change Reconsidered, uh, we have hundreds of articles showing how plants and trees have prospered, food crops, wildlife, human health, and economic growth. We really have to be more on the offensive. And, and, and for the five people each year, you're from now on, are going to convince that man is not uh, causing any impact on the temperature of the planet. We really have to make them understand that carbon dioxide is wonderful. It's wonderful. It's, it's why we live here. I mean, the primary reason that I have no idea whether there's life on other celestial bodies, but I doubt it, is the lack of carbon dioxide. I mean, you've, to have plant life, to feed animals, to feed us, it's all about carbon dioxide, and we're so fortunate to have it, and we're fortunate to have more of it. The Dutch have been drawing their tulips under excessive carbon dioxide for 50 years or more. Intense. They pump in the carbon dioxide. Growth is better. Everything about carbon dioxide is good. And the most important thing we've got to do in the next few years is reverse the endangerment finding. I mean, the absurdity of the... Oh, it, it's, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. The, the 97 consensus uh, situation is so crazy, I will not attempt uh, to explain it to you, but you all have a book in your bag uh, called Why Scientists Disagree on Global Warming, uh, Climate Change, and in it, uh, it explains uh, Naomi Oreskes' uh, original article, and there were three other articles. If you read about how that study, those studies were done to come up with 97%, you have to break out laughing. You just absolutely have to break out laughing. And yet it's been bandied about for so long that if you really don't understand anything about uh, climate, you've been hearing it forever and uh, you accept that number. It's patently absurd. You all know about ClimateGate. You know the lies and all the emails uh, that we found. Uh, the, the alarmists have been uh, doctoring their work and... Uh, uh, hiding their, uh, their emails. We caught them, but of course it doesn't matter to the mainstream media uh, or to the alarmists. The, one of the things that uh, people don't understand about the IPCC is their charge. Uh, there's some people here that were once on the IPCC committee and resigned. The charge was not to find out about global warming or climate change. The charge was only to find man's role in increasing the temperature of the planet. Uh, just so absurdly flawed that it's uh, not worth talking about. So uh, Jim Inhofe mentioned the clean power plan. Uh, ultimately, that's going to save the uh, coal industry. We've been fighting for coal at Heartland uh, for years. Uh, EPA regulations, we're rolling them back literally uh, every day. Uh, Scott Pruitt, I think, was a good choice. He's moving a little slow for my money, but I think we'll get things done. 
The end of the Paris Agreement is critical. Uh, let me tell you a few things about the Paris Agreement that you do not know, but if you read the book Clexit by Don Deers that each of you has in your bag, the entire agreement, I think it's 41 or 47 pages long, is in Don Deers' uh, brief 100-page book called Clexit. And uh, in the book, there are six things you want to know that require, or required of the United States being a part of the agreement. Uh, one, it says, because we're the richest country, we've got to pay most of the bill. Um, Obama uh, committed $3 billion to the Green Action Climate Fund and wrote the check for $500 million. Uh, I'm, I'm reasonably confident that our new Secretary of Treasury isn't going to sign a check for any more uh, money. Uh, the next uh, neat thing is the treaty says that any country other than the United States can sue the United States if they can show that our greenhouse gases floated over their airspace. They can sue us. And if we, uh, we challenge it, the situation is adjudicated by members of the treaty, not a court. By, uh, and Iran has been labeled as one of the countries that would sit on the, uh, the, the adjudication uh, uh, court. It also says that any technology developed in the United States has to prove that it does not significantly increase carbon dioxide or we're not allowed to use the technology. It also says if we develop a technology to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, we must share it with the rest of the world with no remuneration whatsoever. I mean, it's insane. It's, I mean, if you read it, you will be laughing before you get to the end of it as well. We have to withdraw. Uh, unfortunately, the great uh, dressmaker, uh, Ivanka Trump, uh, and uh, Rex Tillerson want us to keep a, a chair at the table. It's really absurd if you think about it. We don't need a chair at anyone's table. We're the strongest country in the world. We, uh, you dance to our tune. We do not want a, a chair at that table. We want the end of it. We'll see what happens. Rex Tillerson and uh, young Ivanka might hold sway with her dad. That would be sad, but kind of understand that. Uh, Trump is doing better than I would have imagined. Pro-environment, pro-energy, uh, pro-jobs. He amazes me. Uh, I, uh, I have a very good friend that played football with him at the New York Military Academy and said everybody thought he was the greatest thing since sliced bread in high school. They loved him. He was captain of the... New York Military Academy's football team. I met Donald in 1987, shortly after he wrote The Art of the Deal. And he was so honest and open about going bankrupt and then coming back. I mean, he was just terrific then. Uh, I was maybe one of the few people, when I saw him come down the escalator, you know, two years ago, come July 16th, that felt that, that he would be a great president because he had nothing to gain other than being a great president. He didn't need any more money. He didn't need any more power. Whether he was bright enough to be everything I wanted, I, I didn't know then. I'm not sure now, but every day I become uh, more certain of it. So uh, climate policy, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if we need a climate policy. We have nothing to do with climate. Uh, you know, it's, way, it's so arrogant. Can you imagine the arrogance of believing that we have an impact on the climate of this planet is absurd. But if, if, if the liberals are not anything else, they're arrogant. So uh, we, we've got to change things, and, and things are changing. Uh, I mean, worst case scenario, we're going to come out of this better. Uh, we've got to end the funding for the terrible things that EPA, NASA, Oceanographic, survey is doing and the United Nations. And, and I, I think our S Treasury Secretary, if I'm assuming the Treasurer has to sign the big checks, uh, I know who he is well enough to think he's not going to be signing any more checks for climate research to uh, these organizations. Well, uh, how can you believe how quickly he moved on the Keystone Pipeline? Uh, you know, the... Uh, Clean Power Plan, this is fabulous. If you want to know more about my plan to devolve EPA to the Committee of the Whole, uh, come to the panel uh, on policy at uh, 4.30 this afternoon with uh, Dennis Headkey and uh, Scott Armstrong. We'll be talking uh, about that. 
Uh, he's rolled, already rolled back drilling, canceling regulation after regulation. Subsidies for wind and solar. Um, I've been hoping for Elon Musk to go bankrupt for years and years. He's way smarter than me. I expect the man has an IQ of 200, and uh, he knows how to game the system. Uh, I predicted that Tesla would be over by now. I love making predictions, and I never mind being wrong. But uh, I predict that he will not be able to put out $500,000, $35,000 Teslas that get 200 miles on a charge, as he claims he's going to do. And eventually, people will begin to real, realize he makes boasts that uh, it cannot happen. But wind and solar should end. Th they really should be over. Both of those industries are, are dead meat if the government stops subsidizing. We're a long way from that. Their lobbies are incredible. Uh, I'd like to think at the end of Trump's eight years, uh, they'll be over, but I, I won't stake uh, my life on it, but we've got to move. Solar and wind, are, I would like to put a PVC solar cell on every hut in Africa. I worked in Chad. You know what happens when the sun goes down in Chad? <laughs> Nothing happens. That's where we need solar energy. A light bulb from a single PVC solar cell would be spectacular. Windmills, you know, they, they have a, a place. I'm not sure anymore where, uh, but uh, if you hate birds, they have a place. Uh, Tonopah is killing a half a million of them a year. And uh, the government gave the right to kill eagles a 30-year right at Tonopah in order to have a $2 billion uh, solar farm operating at 17% capacity. Uh, it's insanity. Eventually, these things have to go away. Uh, nuclear power and the LNT. Look at the top and the bottom. Nuclear power will someday run the world. We can't run out of it. It's the safest form of power. Uh, they're still talking about Fukushima, which uh, didn't uh, cause a single person to get radiation poisoning or die. Uh, they still talk about it as a disaster. I always thought the Japanese were smart, but they've turned off their nuclear power plants. We are not building nuclear anymore. Well, there are two plants being built in Georgia, two in South Carolina. Whether they ever get finished, I'm not sure. But the cost of a nuclear power plant used to cost $3 billion. Now it's $9 billion because we've installed safety requirements to bring radiation down to zero. And it's all because of the low-dose, no-threshold model that is totally flawed. If you're into biology at all, uh, Ed Calabrese is the hero of fighting the LNT. If we could get rid of the LNT and realize that there are thresholds below which uh, radiation is not a problem, which is, is definitely true, uh, the costs of nuclear uh, may come down, though I don't uh, expect it to happen. And uh, we also sent uh, President Trump uh, a list of the materials from which we got all this. Uh, I hope that uh, he takes heed of everything we've done. Uh, it's a lot, and, and so you should know that uh, Heartland has been a go-to place for the president and for his uh, uh, transition team and all the people he's appointed, and uh, it, it's very exciting. Again, thank you all for being here. We'll see you all next time.